I was visiting Rosemary and I was waiting to go to service. And I was walking down, uh, in, she was at Paramount at that time, my sister Rosemary Clooney uh, was a, a, a contract uh, star at Paramount. I was visiting her, went from her bungalow, walking down the streets, of course, hoping to see beautiful girls. That's the point, you know, I was all of 18, I guess, or 19 by that time. And I uh, was walking with my kid sister, Gail, very little, six years old at the time, perhaps. And as I was walking, this mile-long limousine pulled up beside me, and a, a window rolled down, and a very familiar voice uh, called out and said, uh, pardon me, can we speak to you for a moment? And, it, and I looked over, and it was the voice and face of a very well-known actor of the 30s and 40s named Henry Wilcoxon. And I looked at him and I said, uh, Mr. Wilcoxon, yes, sir, uh, wh what can I do for you? And uh, he said, not me. He said, Mr. DeMille wants to talk to you. Well, and Cecil B. DeMille, I had listened to him on Lux Presents Hollywood on radio. I knew all about him, you know, and he was, of course, one of the famous names anywhere. And he said, are you a contract player here? And I said, no, I'm not. And he said, uh, well, I would like you, uh, we, we have uh, something we're looking for, and you seem to be the right look, and uh, I would like you to do a reading for us. I said, okay, great. And so he said, well, just show up at Dubba Dubba and do this. And uh, I said, well, that's fine. And I, uh, it didn't occur to me that this was a big deal, a reading is a reading. Somebody's going to, I know how to read. I'd already been a, an announcer for three years. And so I went back to Rosemary's bungalow and told her, I said, Mr. DeMille wants me to do a reading. Well, she went bonkers. She hadn't even met Mr. DeMille yet. Cecil B. DeMille wants you to... She made me so nervous. <laughs> I started to get scared, you know. I said, hey, it's a reading. What is... And her then husband, Jose Ferrer, came in and said, what? You're going to do a reading for DeMille? Well, do this and do this, you know. And I, by this time, I'm panic-stricken. Went back the next day. Decided the heck with it. I'm just, just going to enjoy myself. What do I care? I'm going to the army anyway. So I went into this room, which had, was brightly lighted, had a couch, and there was uh, a, a black uh, window in front of me. Of course, all that was was a window to a the what we would, I suppose, call a control room or whatever. Mr. DeMille was in there with his entourage, and that was all dark. I couldn't see that, and they could see through and see, see me. Beautiful young woman was there, whom I had never met, and she was a contract player at the time, I understand, and uh, her name was Amanda Blake. And they gave us the script, they had given it to us the night before, actually, the script for Golden Boy, the William Holden starring vehicle. And the only line I remember out of any of it was I was supposed to be on a park bench, and I'm supposed to look up and I'm, I'm nervous about the girl and I'm awkward, and I say, look at that sky. Boy, what a sky. That's the only line I remember. So I did that. They said, do it again. Do it again. Did it. I don't know how many times. It seemed like a hundred. It was probably five times. When it was all finished, I shook hands with Miss Blake and headed out. So, well, that was kind of fun. And I took off and was heading out the door, leaving. And somebody called me back and said, Mr. DeMille wants to see you. So I went back into the dark. And all I could see was his, the outline, the light outline on his pate you know, and he said, Mr. Clooney, um, we thought that that went well. Uh, however, we have a problem. Uh, your face looks like you're 19, and that's what we wanted. Your voice sounds like you're 40, and that's what we don't want. Um, we think that we're going to have to wait until the two get closer to matching before we can use you. And uh, when they do, come back and talk to me. Well, I did, and you know that son of a gun was dead? How about that? That was not fair of him. <laughs> did that dampen your aspirations to, to be an actor? Had you ever thought about being an actor before? You know, the truth is I had never thought in terms of being an actor. I never thought I had the right look for it. Uh, I, I, I have no false modesty. I thought I had the talent for it, but I, I never thought I had a the kind of right look for that sort of thing. And besides which, I was, I was a broadcaster already, and I knew how to do that. It was... What you fight to do in broadcasting is to work your way through that distance that that camera presents to be yourself. If you can fight your way through that without being, ladies and gentlemen, and instead say, here's what's happening. And if you can do that, uh, then I think you have a chance to be successful in broadcasting. In acting, it seems to me it's quite the opposite. 
you have to somehow or another get into somebody else's skin, be somebody else, escape into another person. I never thought I had the ability to do that um, to where I could do it well. I mean, do it uh, among the best. Uh, I thought I could, oh, I always thought I could be among the best broadcasters. Not the best, but I thought I could be among the best 15% of people who did broadcasting. Uh, I never felt that kind of confidence about something like acting or any other field, actually. So uh, that's why uh, broadcasting continued to beckon and still fascinates me today.